it's a very, very great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Professor Anil Seth, who's professor of um, what, neuroscience and cognition and neuroscience. of neuroscience at the University of Sussex. And he's, his, his first degrees were in various aspects, were nat natural sciences, and then various aspects of computing and artificial intelligence. Uh, but now he works uh, at the interface between neuroscience, philosophy, artificial intelligence to study the, the phenomenon of consciousness. Um, and that's what we're going to hear about, one of the great remaining mysteries of, of, of life. Um, and so the, the title is, <laughs> I'm sorry, what is the title? <laughs> <laughs> the title is From Beast Machines to Dream Machines. That's right. From Beast Machines <laughs> to Dream Machines. Um, so, so welcome and thank, thank you for first. giving us this fascinating talk. <laughs> thank you. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. I haven't been in Glasgow since um, Monday. I was here in Monday. So, but before that, it was a very long time ago. So it's lovely to be back. Now, I'm going to start with uh, a short story. It's a story about two philosophers, Ludwig, Ludwig Wittgenstein and Elizabeth Anscombe, who was a fellow philosopher and also Wittgenstein's biographer. Now, the story is, I don't know if it's true, of course, the story is that one day after breakfast, when Anscombe was writing Wittgenstein's biography, they were walking in the garden and Wittgenstein asks Elizabeth Anscombe this question. He says, why did people at one time think that it was natural to assume that it was the sun rotating around the earth that gave us night and day rather than the earth spinning on its axis? This is the kind of thing that Gunstein asks after breakfast, right, of course. And Anscombe thinks about it and she says, well, I guess because it looks as if the sun goes around the earth. Okay. And Wittgenstein replies and he says, okay, what would it look like if it looked as if the sun wrote or the earth rotated on its axis to give us night and day? Which I think I always like this little, little exchange because at one level, Wittgenstein, I think he's just saying how things seem is not how they are. It seems as though the sun goes around the earth, but we all know that it doesn't. But in another level, I think what he's saying is more interesting. He's saying, even when we know how things are, things seem both different and the same. And we kind of experience it in two ways at the same time now. That's where I used to think is going on. So how things seem is not how they are, but in a way it might be. <clears throat> Now, I want you to keep that little story in the back of your mind for the rest of this talk, because I'm going to think it applies in a very similar way to how we understand perception, conscious perception, our experience of the world around us and of being a self within it. So I will start by thinking about our experiences of the outside world. This is uh, Brighton. This is very near to where I live. It's a much nicer street than the street I live in, but it's very, very nearby. And there's an easy kind of how things seem view about perception. You, know, you get up in the morning, you walk outside. Well, actually, that doesn't, <laughs> you say you open your eyes. Usually you open your eyes before you walk outside. You wake up in the morning, you open your eyes, and it seems as though the world just pours itself into your mind through the transparent windows of your eyes and your ears and all your other senses, as if the world out there has all the properties that you experience it as having, colors and shapes and smells and, things, and so on. And we just kind of soak it in into our, into our minds. And it might seem as though the self is the thing inside that does the perceiving. So here's the how things seem to you. You've got a world. We perceive it. You know, the brain perched inside the skull receives all this information, forms perceptions of the world. The self the little mini you inside your skull, the recipient of all this information, forms these perceptions, decides what to do, does something, and back, back we go again. We sense, we think, we act. That might be how things 
seen. But how things seem is not how things are. How things are might be quite different. And the story I want to suggest to you today is that it's not the self that does the perceiving, both the world as we experience it and the self within that world are both forms of perception. They're both brain-based best guesses about what's actually going on out there in the world or in here in the body, and in neither case is it identical to what's out there or in here. In fact, our experiences of the world and the self are best thought of as kinds of controlled hallucinations, brain-based guesses about the world, which are reined in by, controlled by sensory signals that come from the world and from the body. So let's begin to unpack the story. And I'd like to start with vision and even more simply with color. So colors are so important to us as human beings. Colors suffuse our daily lives with beauty, with meaning, with salience. But our experience of color and what colors are is far from straightforward. Now, we don't even need neuroscience for this. We've known physics for, for hundreds of years that our, our ability to perceive color depends on the eye's sensitivity to just a tiny slice of this electromagnetic spectrum, which goes all the way from radio waves at one end to gamma waves at the other end. This thin slice of reality, the so-called visible spectrum, that's where we live color-wise. But electromagnetic radiation is not itself colored, it's just energy. And what's more, even within that thin slice, for most people, our eyes are only sensitive to just three of those wavelengths. Yet, of course, we experience many more than three colors. We experience an almost infinite palette of different colors. So what we experience color-wise is both less than what's really there and more than what's really there. It's a kind of construction that's based on, but far from identical to objective reality. I'll give you one just very simple demonstration of how, and how differently our experience of even something like color can be from what's actually out there in the world. This is a, one of my favorite illusions, which is called the lilac chaser. How many people have seen the lilac chaser before? Seen this before? Hands up. If, if, okay, not many. So what I want you to do, and I hope this works, it's always challenging in a new venue, is focus, well, pick one screen, Focus on the black cross at the middle. Try not to move your eyes or blink. And then what I'd like you to do is, if you start seeing that the magenta discs disappear and just a green disc rotates around in a circle, just raise your hand. Okay, that's good. That's pretty much everybody. Now, if you blink and move your eyes, the green disc should go away and the magenta patches come back. Okay. So there is no green disc. There's no green at all in, in this image. All that's going on are magenta patches that appear and disappear one after the other. This effect is actually a combination of three things in visual perception. One effect is called Troxler fading. This is when things appear in the periphery of our vision, which you know, the eye is not very sensitive to stuff out there. If things appear in the periphery of our vision and have blurry boundaries like the, the patches, they tend to fade away and be filled in by whatever's around them. There's another effect called apparent motion. When things appear and disappear next to each other, the brain infers movement between them. That's how TVs work. And the third thing is color opponency. When the brain gets used to a particular color and then that color disappears, the brain perceives the opposite space, opposite color, in color space. And the opposite color for the brain to magenta is, is green. There's actually a fourth thing going on here, which is that, as we know, colors don't really exist in the world objectively anyway. It's just like, uh, but magenta exists even less than other colors. And I'll explain that in the, in the Q&A, if you really want to know why that's true. Now, the idea that I think can explain this phenomenon, but in fact, all of our perception, is a very simple and old idea. And it's the idea that your brain is a prediction machine. It's always casting predictions out into the world and using the sensory data to update these predictions about what's going on. And that what we see and what we hear and what we feel 
is not a readout of what's out there in the world. It's the content of these predictions that the brain is always making. So it's a very old idea in some form or another. You can trace it back as far as you like. I prefer to trace it back to, to Plato um, and his famous allegory of the cave. Now, in Plato's allegory of the cave, a bunch of prisoners are chained to the wall, and all they see are shadows cast by firelight on the walls of the cave. And they take the shadows to be real because that's all they have access to. Now, updating Plato to the 21st century and just glossing over a few centuries of many centuries of developments in the middle, instead of prisoners in a cave, we have a brain in a skull. Now, try to change your perspective and just imagine what it's like to be your own brain. There you are, you're trapped inside this bony vault of a skull and you're trying to figure out what's out there in the world. Now, it's dark in there, it's silent. There's no color, there's no sound, there's no light. All you've got to go on as a brain are electrical signals, sensory signals that are coming from the eyes and the ears. And these electrical signals are only indirectly related to whatever's out there, objects and people and places and so on. And these electrical signals, they don't come with labels on, like I'm from a cat or I'm from a coffee cup or I'm from the ears or the, or the heart or the, or the nose. They're just electrical signals which are ambiguous, uncertain and indirectly related to what's there. So in order to make sense of these signals, the brain has to, the idea is the brain has to bring to bear it's prior knowledge, beliefs, expectations about the way the world is. And by combining these prior beliefs and expectations with these sensory signals, the brain can form a best guess about what causes these sensory signals. And that is what we end up experiencing. The brain doesn't see light or hear sound. What we experience is the brain's best guess of the causes of colorless, soundless, odorless sensory information. I'll give you one more, actually two more very quick illustrations of just how deeply the brain's expectations can shape how we experience things. Here's another very well-known visual illusion. Again, I want to just get a little show. How many people know this one? It's called Adelson's Checkerboard. A few of you. Okay, great. So in this illusion, if you can see these two squares on the checkerboard, A and B, now they should look to be different shades of gray. Is that right? Do you see them as different? Yeah. Okay, but obviously this is an illusion, so obviously that's not true. And they are in fact exactly the same shade of gray. And I can show you that by putting another version of it here, joining the patches and you can see there's a single shade of gray, not two, one, it's the same. If you think that I'm still messing around with you somehow, well, I'll just move one of those bars over here and you can see, no, it, it really is the same shade of gray that's going on. But if I take that away, again, they look different. So what's happening? So what's happening here is that the brain is using its prior knowledge, knowledge that you are not or, or were not aware that your brain has, that objects under shadow appear darker than they are. Now that combined with a the fact that checkerboards have these, these contrasts, that leads the brain to infer that the patch B is lighter than it really is. Now, is this an error? Like we often think of illusions as errors. Is it an error of your perception that this is happening? No, I don't think it is at all. Your brain, your brain's visual system didn't evolve to be a light meter like a, like a camera a photographer might use. It's designed to figure out what's going on out there in the world. And, and actually seeing this checkerboard is a very good kind of hypothesis that the brain has about what's going on. So that's Adelson's checkerboard. The last one I want to show you, the last example, is again very famous. This is called the rotating mask illusion. How many people know the rotating mask illusion? Yeah, a few of you, mainly on one side of the room, which is interesting. Don't know why that is. Um, okay, so our brains are very sensitive to faces. For human beings' faces are very important, very salient stimuli. And over the whole of evolutionary history, pretty much every face ever encountered by a brain has always pointed outwards. And so the brain expects faces to point outwards. And it expects it so strongly that when faced with a situation like a hollow mass, 
where when you rotate it after a certain point, you know, it's an inward painting face, the concave face. The brain would rather reach the conclusion that the face is rotating in two different directions at the same time than to see an inward pointing face. I think that's, that's rather extraordinary. By the way, it works even better with a real hollow mask because when it's in its inverted state, when it's concave and you're seeing it as convex, the eyes follow you around, um, which is a really brilliant extra addition. So these are all quite fun, but the significance of them, I think, runs quite deep because it really challenges the how things seem view of perception. This is the kind of picture Certainly that I read when I was studying psychology, neuroscience 20, 30 years ago as a, as, a status, as a student. And this is like the how things seem view of perception. It's a classic idea of how perceptual systems work in the brain. This is a monkey brain. And the classic idea is that the heavy lifting of perception is done in this um, outside in direction where information flows into the brain through the eyes, through the ears. And as it flows deeper into the brain, increasingly complicated aspects are, are sort of fished out of it. So early stages of the visual cortex, you fish out things like edges and lines, and then a bit deeper, you fish out things like corners and so on. And then as you get deeper, you get objects, object parts and faces and people, and then eventually whole scenes, as if the sort of, the brain is just putting, picking out features and then putting them together. Now there might be some top-down activity going on, signals going back out to the senses, but in this kind of classic view, the real business is happening in the, in the outside in direction. We're reading out the world through the senses. Now, the view of the brain as a prediction machine really changes all this. Instead of these signals conveying the way the world is and we just, our brains just read it out with these sort of top down, inside out signals, maybe calibrating a little bit, rather, it's the other way around. The brain is continually throwing out predictions into the world about the causes of sensory signals. And the sensory information that comes in is just reporting the difference between what the brain expects and what it gets at every level of processing. These, the sensory information, instead of being read out, becomes prediction error. It just tells the brain how its predictions are maybe not quite right. And in this view, I think what's really significant is that even though it seems as though we perceive the world in this outside in direction, what we perceive is coming from the inside out, from the top down, and is just tied to the world by sensory signals. This is why I use the term controlled hallucination, because when we talk about hallucination, we usually think of a, a kind of false perception, seeing something that's not there or that other people don't see. But that kind of hallucination, well, that's just normal perception that's lost its grip on the world. There's a continuity between hallucination and normal perception. Both come from the inside out, but in normal perception, our brain's best guesses are tied to the world by using these sensory signals as prediction errors. In this view, the whole process of perception becomes a process of the brain continually always just changing its predictions to try to minimize prediction error all the time and everywhere. And the result of that is that the brain's predictions become what in mathematics we call the optimal Bayesian inference. So it's making, it's actually making what we can demonstrate is, a, is the optimal way to figure out what's out there in the world based on the sensory signals that it gets. William James, who was one of the, the founders of psychology in the late 19th century, he really had a very similar intuition even back then. He said, whilst part of what we perceive comes through the senses from the object before us, another part, and it may be the larger part, always comes out of our own head. That, I think, is, is very much on the right track. Now, informally, we might say, put it like this. I mean, we're very used to saying things like, you know, I'll believe it when I see it, trusting our senses. And we should trust our senses a little bit, but it might be more accurate really to say that I'll see it or hear it or feel it when my brain believes it. <clears throat> now, we can use this way of thinking about perception to 
um, extend it to think about some slightly unusual forms of perception. They give us a real clue that this is the kind of process that's happening inside our brains. There's a phenomenon called pareidolia. This is a general term for seeing patterns in things. And again, faces being something that are very important to us. The brain is basically, I think, always just throwing out face predictions and seeing where they stick. And sometimes they stick where they don't, where there aren't any actual faces. So we've all seen faces in clouds. And some of us sometimes see faces elsewhere, like in the windows in a church, or you can see them in a bathroom sink or in a piece of toast or in all sorts of places. There's a great Instagram feed that keeps track of the latest faces in things. Um, so what's happening here is that you know, th this prediction is, is again, it's, it's kind of sticking where it might normally not stick. And to investigate, the, inspired by this, in, in my research group a few years ago now, we thought we would try to um, just amp up this process a little bit and try and simulate what it would be like if the brain had very strong predictions to see particular things that overwhelmed the sensory data. So this... Um, I'm not going to dwell on this. What we did is we used a, a neural network. This, is, this was very kind of advanced at the time, but it's now pretty old hat. But there are these, they, these neural networks which are loosely based on brain architecture, very loosely. And what you do, what, how they work is you show them an image and activity goes up through the network and it tells you what's in the image. Have an image with a dog in and it will tell you there's a dog and probably the breed and all sorts of things. In this, the way they normally work, the activity flows in this, like from the image up to a label that says what's in the image. But what you can do, and what we did, um, Google had done it a little bit before, is we ran it backwards. So we fixed the output to, in fact, dog. And then what you do is you then sh you give it some image and you can update the image until the, the network settles into a stable state. Very intuitively, this is like simulating what would happen if the brain is throwing a prediction about dog back out into, you know, into how it's interpreting its, its sensory input. And so what we decided to do, see what this would be like, we took a panoramic video, like with a 360 degree video camera at Sussex campus, where I work on the South Coast. And we put every frame of this panoramic video through this process. And then we got some, some volunteers to come into the lab, put on a head mounted display, the sort of thing that people use for virtual reality, so they could look around. And then we played this panoramic video. And what we get, what we simulate, this is a little taster of what happens. This is it's much more immersive when you're wearing the helmet, but this was a sort of snapshot from one participant looking around. So they're exploring. This is Sussex campus on a Tuesday. Obviously, nothing wrong here. Totally normal. There's quite a lot of dogs. And what's interesting here for me is this is not kind of a model of a particular behavior that someone's doing or anything like that. It's a model of a kind of experience. Now, some people have told me, and how would I know, that it's a bit like a psychedelic experience. Um, I don't know. I don't think it is. But I think it's, it's kind of it's like a weird, unusual experience of some kind. Really, it's, it's a starting point. It's showing that we can model different kinds of conscious experiences by trying to change this process of how the brain predictions interact with with sensory information um, what we've been doing since then and i won't go into the details because they're a bit detailed is take this basic idea and try and simulate very specific kinds of visual hallucination because they they happen very commonly in lots of different cases people with parkinson's disease often have visual hallucinations, though it's not often talked about. People with Charles Bonnet syndrome, which is a, what ha is a condition involving visual loss, also involve hallucinations. Psychedelic experiences, of course, involve hallucinations, other things too. And they all have different characters. So in Parkinson's disease, the types of visual hallucinations that people have can be quite complex. People, places, um, and they can appear spontaneously. They don't seem to be connected to other things in the environment. Other kinds of hallucinations can be more geometric, like these patterns at the bottom. And still others can be, can be um, what we would call, um, they, they arise out of the environment. Like psychedelic hallucinations often seem to be transformations of what's already there. So what we try to do is, um, using a different kind of neural network, 
again, loosely related to the brain, see if we could simulate these different kinds of hallucinations. And this is just what we're, we're doing at the moment. These are different kinds of input images. There's a bird, a, a toadstool, a lamp, a volcano, a flower. And we just simulate how these images might change in different ways when we're trying to understand the differences between varieties of hallucinations. And then we go to people who have lived the experience of these hallucinations and we ask them which output of the model is most similar to your lived experience. And so what we're really doing here is we're, we're trying to match different ways of consciously experiencing the world, different ways in which the visual system is operating in terms of how it's generating and testing predictions. So we're doing what, what I think is this, is, this is like an example, I think, of what research into consciousness is, is all about. It's trying to explain the basis of how we experience the world and how we experience the world differently. So the summary for this, this section then is, is, is fairly straightforward. It's that hallucination can be thought of as a kind of uncontrolled perception where the brain's best guesses lose their grip on the world. And that perception in the here and now is another kind of hallucination, but a controlled hallucination in which the brain's best guesses are reined in by the world, but reined in not by criteria of accuracy. We never see the world as it is, but reined in by criteria of utility. We see the world in ways that it's useful for us to perceive the world, that evolution has decided what's useful over, over many, many millennia. Now, the, the idea that, that I have kind of in the back of my mind about all this is this is not just applying to odd situations like hallucinations or dogs or faces. It really applies everywhere and all the time. So our experiences of color, of time, of sound, of duration, of, of smell, of even what seems real. I mean, all of these things are varieties of perceptual prediction of controlled hallucination everything that we experience is a kind of perceptual prediction and um, maybe we can talk about in the q a but what we've been doing my lab is, is looking at different aspects of this and trying to figure out how each of these aspects of perception can be understood in 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 the way i've been describing but what i want to do next is, is move on from how we perceive the outside world to our experience of being a self because when we think about what it's like to be a conscious creature in the world, the experience of being a self, of being you or, or, or being me, time to plug the book, which is called Being You, is um, you know, that is probably the most salient central aspect of consciousness, the experience of being whoever we are. And just to rehearse the thing from the beginning, it might seem as though the self is a thing that does the perceiving, but in fact, the idea here is that's not the case. The self is itself a kind of perception, a kind of controlled hallucination, but a very special kind. And the first indication that something like this might be going on is that when you think about what it means to experience being you, being a self, there's not just one thing that defines the experience of selfhood for a, for a human being. There are many different ways in which we experience selfhood. There's the bodily self, the experience of being a body with its all its emotions and moods and having a body, this object in the world that is my body, other things are not. There's a perspectival self, the experience of seeing the world from a particular first person point of view, usually somewhere slightly behind my face. There's the volitional self, what people sometimes confusingly call free will. You know, we experience ourselves as the cause of actions, of the author of our thoughts. Then, only then, that we, we need to talk about the narrative self, the, when we start to associate self with a name, with an identity, with memories of the past and, and plans for the future. Only here does personal identity come in. And then finally, there's the social self, that aspect of self that we perceive through the minds, it, well, sorry, what do I want to say? So the social self for me is that aspect of self wherein part of how I perceive myself is how I perceive others perceiving me. My experience of self that I think all of us partly refracted through the minds of those around us. 
all of these aspects seem bound together in a unified way in our everyday experience of selfhood. But we know from the laboratory, from the clinic, that these different aspects of self can come apart in various ways. And when they do, others can remain. There are people, um, like one thing I talk about in the book is a, uh, a guy called Clive Wearing, who completely loses the ability to form new memories, lives in a permanent present tense of about seven to 30 seconds and has done for about 40 years. But other aspects of his self remain completely intact. There are people who seem to have no, no free will, a kinetic mutism, a condition people make no voluntary actions, experience no sense of volition. And there are people who have extraordinary out-of-body experiences where the perspectival self is altered. And if the self can come apart in all these different ways, I think that suggests to us that our normal everyday of experience in the self should not be taken for granted. It's a clever under the hood construction of the brain going on all the time that helps the organism in the business of survival. Now, I just want to give you a couple of examples again about how this might work and, and what we might understand about the self and thinking about it this way. And I'll focus on, on the bodily self the experience of being and having a body. And the idea here, again, if you just think about being your brain, well, just as you don't have direct access to what's out there in the world, you don't have direct access as a brain to your own body either. Okay? All the information about your body is coming through senses, some of them vision, but there are also senses touch. There's proprioception, the sense of of joint position and movement. And then there's a whole bunch of senses that report the state of the body from within. Like how is the heart beating? How is blood pressure? How are the kidneys doing? All these kinds of things. And the idea is instead of just reading out this information, well, the same principle applies. These, these sensory signals that are telling the brain about the body are ambiguous, noisy, and unlabeled. So the brain it's likely, again, to be in the business of making predictions about the causes of these sensory signals and updating them on the basis of data. So our experience of self turns out to be another kind of controlled hallucination. Now, again, there's a number of, of demonstrations about how our experiences of self can, can change to show that, that the brain is on the fly putting them together. My favorite by quite a long way is, is this one. It's called the rubber hand illusion. How many people have seen the rubber hand illusion? Okay, several, but not everybody. Right, the idea of the rubber hand illusion is, is very simple. Um, what's happening in this illusion is there's this guy in blue, he's sitting behind a desk. His real left hand is hidden from his sight by this cardboard partition. And in front of him, in a place where his left hand might normally be, is a fake hand, a rubber hand. And he's looking at it. And the guy in green has two paintbrushes. And what he does is he strokes both hands simultaneously in synchrony. And he does this for a while. And the idea is, from the perspective of the brain of the guy in blue, it's like, well, you know, I can see a hand. It doesn't look like my hand, but whatever. It's pointing in roughly the right direction. Um, it's not joined to my body. We'll overlook that. Um, I see a hand. I see it being touched. And I'm also feeling touch because my real hand is being stroked as well. So from the brain's point of view, yeah, well, maybe that's the best guess. That's the most likely explanation, prediction of what's going on, that the, fact, the rubber hand is somehow part of the guy's body. So that's the idea. And the way you test it is there's many ways to test how it works, but this is far and away my favorite way to test it. There are other ways to test it too, but but yeah, I mean, it is true that even if you just threaten the hand, you can see like skin conductance responses and all kinds of things that that kind of suggests that the, that fake hand has been assimilated somehow into this this guy's brain's experience of what the body is. Now, as 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 fun as it is, there are, there's quite a lot of detail underneath this. One thing to say is that nobody, at least not in my experience, gets convinced right they don't have a delusion they know it's not their hand the experience is a little bit 
um, weird and uncanny. It's kind of sort of, but, but not really. There are other conditions that mainly happen in psychiatric or neurological illness where people really believe that, that things like they actually have a hand, but they might believe it, it's somebody else's hand. This is a condition called somatoparaphrenia. There are things like phantom limb, where after amputation, people experience them still, themselves as still having limbs that are no longer there. This is a milder um, illusion, but it's still quite striking. It also varies a lot between different people. And I think this, this highlights another point. It's not just the brain putting together vision and, and touch that, that drives this illusion. It, it might be something else. And my colleague at Sussex, Peter Lush, spent an extraordinarily long time trying to figure this out because what he noticed in it was that people experienced it with different intensities. And he had the idea that the rubber hand illusion and many things like it are driven not just by the sensory information, but by the brain's kind of expectations about what they should experience in the context. There's a very old concept in psychology called demand characteristics. And this is the idea that when you're, you're in, a, in an experiment, it can sometimes be kind of clear what you're, what you're expected to experience. And in the rubber hand illusion is a very good example of that. They put a hand in front of you, they stroke it, they ask you, oh, does it feel like your hand? And so there's quite a strong, like, you know, implicit encouragement to have a particular experience. And people can have experiences that way. And they're more likely to have them if they are more hypnotically suggestible. We're all hypnotically suggestible, yes we are, but just to different degrees. It's like a stable psychological trait. So what Pete did was he did the rubber hand illusion on 353 people at Sussex, which took quite a lot of time, and um, measured not only their, hip their response to the rubber hand, but also um, their hypnotizability on a scale. And what he found very, very briefly was that there is indeed a correlation. So the more hypnotizable somebody is, the more strongly they, they experience the rubber hand illusion. Now, this is still very compatible with the overall idea I'm saying, because basically the brain is making, in this case, the idea is if you're highly hypnotizable, the brain is making predictions about what to experience on the basis of the overall context of, this, of the experiment. And... I wanted to mention this because it's not just the rubber hand illusion. I think it actually is a factor that shapes a lot of our experiences in different ways for different people. So we tried a bunch of other things. How many people know this? This is, I like this one. This is called um, the jumping pylon, obviously. How many people sort of hear something when the pylon lands? Don't be shy about raising your hand if you do. Not many. Okay, there's a, there's a couple. There's a couple. This kind of went all around the internet not you know, when, it, when it first came out because people, a lot of people said, I hear a sort of hear a thudding sound. Um, there is, of course, there's no sound at all. It's just, it's just silent video. But again, the context encourages you to have a, an auditory experience. So this too turns out to correlate quite strongly with hypnotizability. Um, other ones do as well. There's a phenomenon also that sort of took off on the internet called ASMR, Autonomic Media and Sensory Response. So people, there's some people who find like videos of people folding handkerchiefs very, very um, pleasurable. You know, it gives them very nice sen sensory experiences. That correlates very strongly with suggestibility. So do the jumping pylons. But other things like, this is a very low level visual illusion called the muller liar illusion. These two lines look different lengths, but they're exactly the same length. It's just the context of the arrowheads. This does not. So it doesn't affect everything. But I kind of think this is important because it means the way we experience the world and the self is going to be shaped in different ways for each of us by this trait that, that we all have. Um, and we may not know how we have it. Very important, by the way, for things like um, the effectiveness of treatments and psych and and behavioral cognitive therapies and then placebo effects and things like this. Things might work a lot better if you're highly hypnotizable. So it's not a bad thing, it's a good thing. Okay, so moving on and getting towards the end is, I talked a bit about having a body, but really for me, the most basis of self, the, the foundation of being a conscious self is the experience of being a body with emotion and mood and this simple, hard to describe feeling of just being alive. 
being a living organism. Now, I've already mentioned the fact that the brain, when it's dealing with the body, has to perceive signals that come from within the body. And this is a whole different kind of perception that is called interoception. Interoception is broadly speaking, the sense of the body from within. And it's in contrast to exteroception, which are all the classic senses we're familiar with, it, vision, hearing, touch, taste, smell. But a lot of the brain is dedicated to perceiving, controlling the body from within. Because if you think about it, that's the most fundamental duty of any brain is to keep the body and therefore itself alive. Everything else is secondary to that. And the brain doesn't have direct access to how or where the heart is or how it's doing or how distended the gut is. It has to infer it on the basis of sensory data again. So the same story applies. Oops, sorry. I meant to go um, to this slide. Why did it go too fast? Yeah, so there's this exchange now of predictions and prediction errors, a controlled hallucination. But this whole process now is unfolding inside the body, not between the body and the world. And the idea is what we consciously experience when the brain is making predictions about the body from within. Well, that's not sort of objects in the world. That's emotion and mood. That is the experience of self. But the process is exactly the same by which these experiences are formed. But there's one very interesting difference. Well, there's many differences. One particular difference to emphasize between how the brain is predicting and interior of the body from how it deals with the outside world, which is that interoceptive predictions, these predictions about the interior of the body, are more about controlling things rather than finding things out. When we can predict something, we can control it. Like any engineer knows this. To be able to predict is a very good way to control. And when it comes to the interior of the body, the brain doesn't really care about where things are or what shape they are. It cares about how well they're doing and how it's involved in control and regulation to keep the heart beating where it needs to be in order to stay alive and so on. Whereas predictions about the world are more to do with where things are. Are they moving towards me or not? Now, there's, a very, there's lots of, of ways of thinking about this, and I, I won't go into all of them, but one of my favorite is this, this back in the 1950s when artificial intelligence was just a, a glimmer in, in people's minds, there was also this idea of cybernetics, which was equally popular at the time. And it was a whole different way of thinking about machines and machine intelligence, which is much more regulated in, so much more based in control and regulation. And this guy, Ross Ashby, one of our, my favorite overlooked intellectual heroes, said things like, every good regulator of a system must be a model of that system. I think he's pointing at a deep truth here that brains evolved to control and regulate the body. Everything else flows from that, including the way we perceive the world around us. And this has implications for how we perceive. Like when the brain is predicting faces in clouds, we experience faces. But what does it mean to experience a prediction about the body? Well, just as visual predictions underpin visual experiences, like figuring out where things are and they moving, so visual experiences are objects and, and spaces between them and so on. But predictions about the body from within underpin embodied experience. The brain doesn't care where things are, it cares how well it's doing. And if you think about it, that's what experiences of the self and within are like. Things are good or bad, likely to be good or bad in the future. They have valence. They don't have position. So this is, I think, is a nice example of how different kinds of prediction can tell us about the different ways we experience the world versus the self, but based on the same fundamental idea. And if you put on this thread far enough, and this is what I, I try to do in the book, so I see how far this goes, I come to the conclusion, it's something I didn't expect to come to when I was starting along this path, which is that because the fundamental duty of the brain is to keep the body alive, and because this applies right down even to within individual cells, that the predictive machinery that underlies all our experiences of the, of the self and of the world, all have their roots in the fact that we have flesh and blood living systems. The body is not just a meat robot that carries our information processing brains from one meeting to another. Mind, life, and consciousness are intimately and deeply related. Now, 
no lecture on consciousness is complete without having a little go at Rene Descartes. And so I'll have a little go at Rene Descartes because he said exactly the opposite. Among many things he said, he was, of course, a brilliant, brilliant man. But when he was speaking about non-human animals, for various reasons, he, had to, he was denying them consciousness or at least the kind of consciousness that matters. So he called them beast machines or, or bet machine in the French. Um, Without minds to direct their bodily movements, animals must be regarded as unthinking, unfeeling machines that move like clockwork. Their status as living creatures didn't matter, was irrelevant to whether they had mind consciousness or not. And I think completely the opposite. I think that because all the machinery that underlies our experience evolved, develops, and operates from moment to moment, always in light of this fundamental biological imperative to stay alive, that we perceive the world around us and ourselves within it, with, through, and because of our living bodies. So to summarize, and then I'll just move on to a few implications. We started with the idea that our experience, our perception of the world around us isn't a readout of a mind-independent reality. It's an active construction, a controlled hallucination tied to the world in ways that are tuned by usefulness, not by accuracy. This idea applies also to the self. The self is not the thing that does the perceiving. The self is a kind of perception. Our experience of all aspects, but here I talked about the body, is another kind of brain-based best guess about what in the world is the body. This also applies to the body from within, all the signals that convey the state of our messy physiological reality. And predictions about the body have more to do with control and regulation, which explains why at the heart of being a conscious self, there is this fundamental experience of just being alive. Now, what would it seem like if it seemed as if our experiences of the world and the self were just kinds of controlled hallucinations? Well, I want you to think right back to Wittgenstein, because I think our experiences of the world and the self would seem both totally different, but also exactly the same. Now, I'll finish just by moving on to a few implications of this, this way of thinking and talk about dream machines as well as beast machines. So one implication of all this is that if consciousness is really intimately tied to life in the way that I've been suggested, well, Conscious AI is not just a, is not likely to happen anytime soon. There's an awful lot of fuss about artificial intelligence at the moment. How many people have played with uh, Chat GPT here? A few of you. Okay, yeah, it's really it's kind of, it's impressive, right? But it is also remarkably weird. I mean, I, I, it makes so many odd mistakes and confabulates. It's arguable whether it's intelligent. I don't think it is, but it's certainly not conscious. Consciousness and intelligence are very different things. And um, just making systems smarter is not necessarily going to make them conscious. The, the substrate, you know, the, the, our, our biological reality, our flesh and blood reality might really matter for whether something is possibly conscious or not. So, yeah, OpenAI, ChatGPT is not conscious. But what it might be able to do soon is give us the incorrigible impression that it is because we are always as human beings we're very susceptible to anthropomorphism we project mind and consciousness into things very very easily and so we might be in a situation where we're we're even though we know that all that's going on under the hood of these new machine learning systems is just sort of abstract information processing we can't help but attribute consciousness to them in the same way that we couldn't help see those two squares as being different shades of gray and that in itself will be quite socially disruptive, I think. We'll have to get used to living in a world where we, where we experience artificial systems as being conscious, even when we know they're not. On the flip side, what about other animals? If consciousness is more tied towards life and is not the same thing as intelligent, well, the space of conscious creatures might be much larger than we presume. I mean, people talk here, I know, I talked a little bit to Felicity about fish before the, the talk started. I spent a week with octopuses a few years ago, which really made a big impact on me. You know, these creatures, um, they give a strong impression of the presence of a conscious mind. But the, what really struck me is how different that mind would be from our own. 
octopuses have more neurons in their in their arms collectively than their central brain. So it might even be that there's something it is like to be an octopus arm. And it's not just that other animals might experience the same shared world differently. I think all of us do. You talked a little bit about this um, hypnotizability, but we all have different brains. So we all are likely to experience even the same world slightly differently as Anais and Nin said. We do not see things as they are. We see them as we are. And we're very used these days to externally visible diversity. You know, we're all different skin colors and heights and body shapes, different accents. And as a society, I think we now realize that this kind of diversity is beneficial for society, but it certainly exists. But there's another kind of diversity, which is on, on the inside, inner diversity. Now, people talk often about neurodiversity, and I think rightly so. But this term has tended to become associated with specific conditions like autism or ADHD, ironically reinforcing the idea that if you're not neurodivergent, then you're neurotypical and you see things as they are. But this can't be the case. We all have different brains. And the reason I think we don't realize it, well, there are three reasons. Firstly, obviously, I don't know what anybody's experience is actually like. I can only experience my own. Another reason is language. Language is amazing, but the price of using words to communicate how we experience the world is that we gloss over the subtle differences that might exist between us. And the third reason is that the character of experience itself is that we see the world as it is. It doesn't seem as though it's my brain's construction. It seems as though it's just there. All of these things together, I think, lead us to underappreciate how differently we might each experience what's going on. This is occasionally challenged. So this is the last example I'll show. This is, the, um, this is the dress. How many people see this as blue and black? How many people see it as white and gold? No, it's very asymmetric. How many people have no idea what I'm talking about? Hopefully nobody. You should all have seen this dress. It's been around for ages. It's, of course, a badly exposed photo of the dress. And the reason I want to talk, mention it now is not to settle the argument about what color it is. It is blue and black. Um, but... The reason it, it, it became such a, a social media phenomenon was that people found it very difficult to accept that somebody else could see the same thing differently than they could. But of course, it, when it's not just addressed. This is happening everywhere and all the time. So here's something you can all do to help, actually. Um, in trying to learn more about this hidden landscape of inner diversity, of perceptual diversity, with, with my colleagues, including Fiona McPherson, who's a professor of philosophy, the university here, we have this project called the Perception Census, which is a large scale survey across many different forms of perception, vision, time, sound, music, body, trying to understand how differently we all experience the world around us. Um, it's easy to take part. It's still, we're still collecting data. It's fun to do, at least people say it is. All you need is your own computer. And you just you can look, you can just search for that or search for my name and you'll find it very easily. And um, you can come and go, come back to it, leave it, and contribute to our understanding of this. And you don't get any money, but you get the warm glow of having helped advance um, psychological science. We've already had twenty thousand people take part from more than a hundred countries. So it's we're trying to make this a real landmark, one of a kind study. So we look at sound, time, music, all sorts of things, trying to understand what the differences really are that separate, but that bring us together too. Now, just finish the last five minutes and then we'll move to questions with a dream machine. And it's a bit, my title from Beast Machines to Dream Machines is a bit, a bit unfair because they're not connected that much, but I wanted to tell you about the dream machine. It's where the perception sense came from. And it's, it's I think, another... It's what I've been doing for the last two years that sheds a different kind of light on the nature of conscious experience. Did anybody go to the Dream Machine, by the way? Last summer, it was in Edinburgh. There's a couple of people. Um, we, yeah, as, sorry, it was in Edinburgh, not Glasgow. But, you know, that's the way things are sometimes. The Dream Machine was based on the work of two people about 60 years ago. There was an artist called Brian Geisen. He was quite a well-known artist in the kind of beat movements. 1950s, 60s, and so on. And a neuroscientist, William Gray Walter, one of the pioneering British 
neuroscientists and, and other, you know, he was an engineer as well, all sorts of things. And the story goes that one day, Brian Geisen was on a bus in the south of France, and he was going past, the bus was going past a stand of trees. The sun was setting, and he was falling asleep, so his eyes were closed. And so he got this kind of flickering light effect that was coming in through the window. His eyes were closed, and he started to have all these very dramatic visual experiences of colors and shapes, vivid, deep colors, more rich than in normal life. And when the bus left the stand of trees, the vision stopped. And Geisen got very intrigued by this and wanted to recreate it and, and allow other people to have this extraordinary experience because he found it very moving. He found the work of Gray Walter, who'd written a chapter in his book, 1953 book, called Revelation by Flicker, who'd been doing some experiments using stroboscopic light, um, shining it at people with, with their eyes closed, noticing the similar um, effects people had extraordinary experiences in measuring what was happening in the brain. So Geisen, with um, with uh, Gray Walter and a mathematician called Ian Somerville, built the first dream machine. It was very low-fi, very charming. It was just a, a light hung above a turntable inside a cardboard tube that was spinning with slits cut into it. So you got a kind of flashing light effect. People would sit in front of it and have extraordinary experiences. Now, Geisen wanted this to become more popular than television, but it didn't. Television won. Um, but he thought of it as a really important cultural contribution, challenging the way we've fed cultural content. You are the artist. What the dream machine incites to see is yours, because everybody has a different experience in the dream machine, just as in the day in, in the world around us. So just to bring it to a, a close, we've been doing something very similar. We try to reinvent the dream machine for the 21st century. So in my lab, we've been working on this phenomenon for about the last 10 years with strobe lights and figuring out what's happening in the brain and so on. But then just um, around the time of the pandemic, a woman called Jennifer Crook called me and said she wanted to, to, to reinvent Geisen's vision and do something for the general public, bring it to large numbers of people. So we put together a team with, with musicians, John Hopkins and architects, Assemble, and engineers and developers to build a new kind of dream machine. But this one was a collective experience. So 20 or 30 people at a time could go into this space, relax, lie down, do breathing exercises. There were 80, more than 80 loudspeakers that gave a 32 channel soundtrack to guide people through it. Lots of strobe lights hidden near the roof. People would come in and have a journey of really you know, off the streets from wherever and have a very unexpected visual experience because it's just flickering white light. That's all that's happening. And this is a dream machine here. This one is in Belfast. We were in a church in Belfast. We were in Edinburgh and Murrayfield Ice Rink in London, in, um, in Woolwich, and in, uh, in Cardiff. And altogether, over summer last year, we had about 40,000 people come through the dream machine, each of them having a unique and unexpected, and in some cases, transformational experience. When they would come out of the dream machine, they could sit around in this area and give us data and talk to each other and also draw. I just want to. Um, emphasize that because the drawings they made were quite amazing. We have 15,000 drawings scanned in of people's experiences in, in the dream machine. This was the dream machine in Edinburgh. A bit more, bit more kind of stranger things vibe going on there, I think. We asked people what they felt. Over about 8,000 people, the, the most popular emotion by a long way was peace, peaceful, followed by awe and, and safe and euphoric and happy. A few people were bored, but you know, can't please everybody. The drawing table was, was here, and I'll just finish with a few images of what people drew. And they're really quite beautiful. Um, and you can see how different they are. So we're hoping to continue the dream machine and, and, and bring it to other audiences in other cities. But I'll leave it there for now and just wanted to say thank you to these are all the people that are my team and people used to be and collaborators who contributed to the work that I've described. Just to remind you again, if you would like to help and do it and spread the word, I'd be really grateful if you'd give the perception census a go. You can do the first section, it just takes half an hour. And if you really get into it, then so much the better. And if you want to dive into these ideas a bit more, well, I do have this book, um, which is on sale in all good bookshops as well. So I will leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, um, let us start the question and answer session.
Um, raise your hand if you have, uh, there's someone with a hat there. And then someone down there after that. Uh, hat. Hat. Hat person. Hat. hat. Yeah. Perhaps we should pass the hat around. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Um, first, thank you. Is it okay? Yep. I will just speak very loudly. Am I here? Yeah. Cool. But it's like uh, those. There's a stand. Okay. Stand up and shout. Okay. <laughs> I'll repeat the question uh, for the people online. So uh, the question is: If some people would have like some neurological disorder. Would that not be like a different type of brain instead? What is your vision on that? Sorry, what was the last bit? What is your vision from people with neurological disorders? Would it just be a different type of brain? Or how do you see that? Well, I mean, that's, yes. I mean, that that's kind of the, I suppose that's definitional to what it is. I mean, if you have a neurological disorder, then you know, you've got some identifiable you know, alteration in your brain, whether it's injury or, or disease. Um, I think my perspective on these things, so I'm not, I'm not a medic, right? So I don't, I don't get involved in treatment, but um, historically there's been, there's a large focus on what neurological disorders and diseases do to people's external competences, their ability to behave in, in particular ways move in particular ways and less attention to what things how it changes people's experiences so in the middle of the talk i talked a bit about parkinson's disease um which is a neuro neurological uh, condition also there are forms of dementia i didn't mention lewy body dementia it's not just that that leads to memory loss which a lot of people focus on but also hallucinations and things like that too so there are often a lot of things that happen people's experiences as well as their abilities but that gets slightly less attention. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm interested in, of course, all of it, but, but I think trying to understand how people's conscious experiences change in these conditions is both useful because when we're trying to understand consciousness in general, you know, it, it always helps to look at how it can alter in different, in different ways. But I also think it's useful for these conditions themselves because really, you know, if you're the person with a, a neurological condition, you know, your experience matters. It's not just how you behave. And of course, that matters too, but also your own experience matters. So trying to shed more light on that, I think, is also important. Hello. Um, thank you very much for the talk and maybe even more for all the years of research that led to those, all these valuable uh, findings. I have a similar interest to the previous question, but maybe less so on the extreme cases, and I'm curious, what do you think are the main implications of this in terms of uh, mental well-being and, and happiness, and perhaps yeah. how did it impact you personally? That's a very, very good question. So the implications for health, well-being, and, and I mean, if, how it's affected me personally is always, it's a very difficult question to answer, because I don't have the alternative version of me that did something else um, to compare against. But you know, I do think it. I do think it's helped, and I'll, I'll explain why um, by making the, the case in general. Um, I think there are many, many implications. One implication is, you know, not just limited to my own work by any means, but this whole this whole field, and it's, it's indeed related to neurological diseases, but also psychiatric disease, also mental health conditions, you know, and not necessarily the most severe ones. The things that just impact our ability to to thrive and flourish in, in society. You know, these are huge problems. We all know things like depression exert huge social, economic, and personal cost, and the treatments we have are not very good. In psychiatric conditions in general, we don't have very many treatment options. We have talking therapies, and we have some pharmacological therapies, but they tend to suppress the symptoms rather than addressing the causes. It's a bit like in psychiatry, you've got things like paracetamol, but we don't have an antibiotic. Um, and that needs to change. So one way that this might be able to change is by understanding you know, the, the mechanisms that generate 
the altered experiences that people suffer in these kinds of conditions. And that's kind of what this whole enterprise is, is about. You know, if we can understand what's generating hallucinations and schizophrenia as well, let's say, then we might be able to develop better diagnosis, prognosis, and, and interventions. But that's kind of, uh, that's quite far away, but I think that's the, that's the long game. The shorter term, there are some immediate things. So one of the um, exciting developments in psychiatry at the moment is the use of psychedelics as therapies for, for depression. But these are complicated, right? They're not for everybody. They're not accessible for, for everybody. They're still illegal, frankly. Um, and that, you know, they, they, there's some downsides too, but they show a certain promise. And why do they work? I mean, people haven't really necessarily addressed that question. When they work, why do they work? Well, I think there's a, an overlooked reason. Traditional um, pharma pharmaceutical approaches to depression are rather ironic in my view, because the ones we have have been licensed for use precisely because they do not affect our conscious experience. So therefore they cannot be abused in the same way. Um, but if, you want, if you're looking for a new drug to, to treat a condition, you look for three things. You look for, is it toxic? Is it addictive? And you want no's to those things. And does it affect the system in question? You want a yes to that. Traditional SSRIs don't do that. Psychedelics do. And in more intuitively, you know, a feature of something like depression is that you get into perceptual habits. You, know, you, you see things in a particular way and that becomes your reality. So by allowing people to realize in the first person that their experiences come from within and can change, I think that's part of the process. And there are other ways to get that. So the, the dream machine that we finished on, you know, we, didn't, we just wanted to give people this experience and start them on a journey of discovery about the power of their minds and brains. But what we found was so many accounts of people finding the experience very transformational for their mental health and well-being, people with depression, people with anxiety, maybe for the same reason that you have flickering light and you realize the power of your own brain to generate experience, which opens a space where, that you can work with to break the habits that you're in. So we are, we're writing a series of grants now to trial this um, strobe light stuff as an alternative uh, depression therapy. But this is a longish answer. I wanted to finish with this. There's a more prosaic way I think it, it enhances well-being, which I think has benefited me, which is just the recognition that the way we experience the world and the self is not given. It's always changing. It's always a construction. Now, that is very valuable to, to, to hold in mind because it opens, again, it opens little this window between how things seem and how they are. Meditation can do this too. So th that recognition, I think, does have a strong potential for all of us. And the perception sense of recognizing that we each see the world differently, you know, that provides new platforms for empathy, communication, understanding. So yes, I feel quite strongly about this because I don't think that consciousness research is just sort of armchair philosophy and intellectual pursuits for the grand questions. I think it makes a difference to all of us because consciousness is a mystery that matters. It's how we live our lives. So yeah, it needs to make a difference in There's the world. There's a question and there and then one over there. Hello, um, thanks, that was absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm struggling slightly to formulate my question, but I think your answer has, has helped me a bit there. Two things kept occurring to me during that. One was the um, Oliver Sacks book, The Man Who Took His Wife for a Hatch. So yeah. presumably things can go wrong about what your, what your brain is sending out in terms of expectations. But the second thing that occurred to me was um, anorexia. Mm. And you're talking about this consciousness research. Is, is, is there a link there or is potentially is there a link there that would help with, with a serious condition like anorexia? There's a potential link, and it's important not to overplay, I think, because it's don't want to give the impression that, like, here's the thing that's going to solve everything. I mean, these are very serious conditions that have multiple causes, multiple instantiations. But, the, you, and it's not, also, it's not my area, so I, I don't want to um, overstep too much. But I know of work that seems very interesting and relevant to me that is looking at body perception in this. So think, you know, the rubber hand illusion, for example, just shows us how our experience of the bo of what is and what is not the body can change. And so, you know, one thing that certainly happens in anorexia and in other related uh, disorders, body dysmorphic disorders, is that people's perception of their body becomes, uh, you know, 
different from how other people perceive their own bodies and more decoupled from the way it actually is people you know they perceive themselves as as fatter than they are and understanding you know how the brain constructs the experience of, of body i think provides an avenue so whether it's just by showing these people this goes on or even doing some kind of feedback training in virtual reality where you give people, you allow them to recalibrate their experience of their body. You know, I think that that helps too. And then, of course, you know, there's all the, the interior stuff. So how do people with anorexia perceive in, internal signals, that's, that, that signal of satiety and appetite? And that's harder to, to intervene. Signals that go back and forth purely within the body, much harder to deal with than, than things we can sort of intervene in when they go outside the body body loop but i still think there might be potential there so short answer is yes but i think it's it's quite a long game there are two questions over the uh, side uh, uh, plus rubber hand illusion if you ask the person to move their hand yep. and the rubber hand doesn't move yep. so your eyes and your proprioception are telling you different stories or for instance if you got the rubber hand to move and their hand didn't which yep. would be very interesting to do. Um, does does that destroy the illusion? It does. Yeah, that breaks the illusion because now there's an incong incongruity. Um, but you know, in the same point, one of the experiments we did, I didn't describe. <clears throat> excuse me. We use virtual reality again to have, give people a virtual hand instead of a rubber hand. So they would put a headset on, they would see a virtual hand, which could look very similar to their own hand because we have a camera that they see a hand which is virtual and then we can make it move because it's virtual so when they move their hand the fake hand moves and so that that really drives a very strong experience because now instead of just passively sort of receiving data and figuring out what's going on the brain is if you like actively testing it the brain is hypothesis testing you know, it makes a movement and the hand moves in the way you expect and of course you can you can then mess around with that and make the hand move in slightly different ways and see how much time lag you can introduce and so on. So you can do lots of lots of interesting things. Or maybe it's not a hand and you have a spoon that moves, but if it moves when you move your hand, maybe you start to feel the spoon is part of your, but you, yeah, you can, people have gone quite crazy with these kinds of designs, um, but they all speak to the same point that the more sort of evidence the brain has and the more plausible it is you know, from the overall context, the more you'll experience this phenomenon. The microphone is working its way down to you, uh, I promise you. Um, uh, hi, uh, yeah. I was just wondering, is there an advantage to the brain being a prediction machine that uses sensory input to correct error as opposed to operating more reactively to sensory input? Or is that more the only way it makes sense for the brain to work? No, it's a good question. I think there is a strong advantage to it. I mean. There's the well-worn quote that nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution. And um, brains that are, eight, so first thing is prediction is not necessarily about the future. So prediction can be about the present, you know, predicting what's the most likely thing now that's causing the sensory signals that I'm getting now. So the first functional benefit of doing this is it turns out to be a way in which the brain can approximate Bayesian inference and you know, the optimal way of figuring out what's going on based on uncertain data. So that's already very good because you can't actually do Bayesian inference because you, you have to approximate it. It's possible for this to actually do. And so this process of prediction error minimization, you can show mathematically it approximates the sort of ideal solution. So that's one. But then of course, prediction when you do build in the future is, is very, very important for, for animals. Like even at the level of physiological regulation, if I was sitting down, if you all stood up now, you know, your brain is already anticipating that you'll have a drop in blood pressure when you stand up. And the, the ability of your brain to predict that is why you don't faint when you stand up. So that you know, can spin out from that to you know, predicting what's in other people's minds and therefore getting food and so on. So prediction, I think, is absolutely fundamental in enabling control, in enabling perception, and enabling us to deal with a complex and temporally structured world. My first question was, and it was very early on in your speech, when do brains start predicting at yeah. birth and youth? Does it progress with age? You sort of answered that. 
by saying that evolution decides how our brains work. Now, the question, therefore, is that in almost all of your research, you use European brains. Yep. Do Chinese brains who spent sort of 500 years in isolation <laughs> or African brains yep. see it the same way as us? And as a second question, location of pain. Mm -hmm. Doctors kept on asking me, where is the pain and how yep. bad is it? Now, and how do pain relief tablets actually work? Yeah. Do we just make this up as we go along? It's relieving our pain. Because I'm in constant pain as a result of an operation. No, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So let me start with the first, I thought there's kind of three questions in there. I'll start with the first one about um, development and children. And, and this is a really good question. Nobody really knows. So evolution will have installed things in. And it, it's, 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 it's as hard to do experiments on young children as it is to do on non-human animals because they don't cooperate or talk to you. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's very, very likely. I mean, it's, developmental psychology experiments have been done do show that the brain comes kind of preloaded with some ways of perceiving the world. But of course, there are many debates in developmental psychology about stages that happen. Jean Piaget talks about these different stages that infants go through and um, it, so developing different ways of being able to predict. For instance, when an ob object disappears and then reappears, that's something that takes a while for children to, to develop. But So there may be no single point in which the brain starts predicting. It may start predicting certain things very early and then other things later on. Some brain imaging experiments that have been done show that it the signs of, of sort of predictive perception that we see in adult brains don't appear very, that they don't seem to be there quite early in, you know, in one, two-year-olds. But that might be for other reasons. The brain of an infant is, is not just a smaller adult brain. It's very different in all sorts of ways. It lacks the kind of insulating material that adult brains have, and we don't know what difference that makes. So it's, it's very, very hard. Maybe the prediction probably starts even before birth, you know, in, in the womb. But um, not a lot is, it's very hard to give you a clear answer on that. On the second question about cultural diversity, I think this is really, really important. Um, the vast majority of experiments in psychology, neuroscience, have been done not only just on Western people, but on undergraduate psychology students, which is wonderful as they are, is probably not representative of society in general. So, you know, people do look at individual differences, and that's what we're doing with the perception census too, but we are still limited that so far it's only in English. Um, and although, you know, we look at much wider age range and across different countries, there is quite a lot of interesting cross-cultural work, but I think it's super interesting. There are some good examples of how differences in culture and language can shape perception. It's one of the oldest questions. People know about the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis? Have you seen a film Arrival? Watch a film Arrival, it's brilliant. It's all about language and perception, even though it seems to be about heptopods. Um, it's the sapir Whorf hypothesis is this uh, idea that language not only changes how we describe what we experience, but changes our experience. So we experience things differently. And it's quite controversial, but I think there's quite good evidence, at least in some cases. So Russian speakers, native Russian speakers, are able to distinguish more shades of blue than non-native Russian speakers. And so language in this case is really changing perception. There may be many other examples of this, but they're on a bit less solid ground. But yes, absolutely, I think there needs to be you know, more cross-cultural uh, work to understand how we perceive differently, not within societies, but across societies. And the final question about pain, I'll answer this very quickly so we can, we can move on. Yeah, it's, it's, Pain is a very strange, very distressing. I'm sorry about what you're, you're going through, but it, where is it? It's in your head. You know, it's not in your body. Your pain is always in your head. And there are, there are phenomena like referred pain. You, ex, you project the experience into somewhere, but, you know, we can often get it wrong. Like we feel pain in our, our back, but actually it might be something else in our body that's causing, you know, the pain that we feel somewhere else. And people with amputations, again, can feel pain. They don't even have a limb where they feel that pain. You know, how do, and then you have a range of painkillers, 
the amazing thing to me is how good placebos can be in, in this case, right? Placebos actually work quite well as painkillers, even when you know they're placebos. So there are open label placebo studies which show that placebos work when you know they're placebos. And even more interesting, but there are some studies which show that when you, you, you experience pain relief because you've, you've taken a placebo that you know is a placebo, the effect of that can be blocked by when people are given um, uh, a chemical that blocks the effects of actual painkillers. So this, is, this is, gets very strange now. So the placebo is having a kind of physiological effect in the body such that that effect is no longer there when you block that effect. So, um, so expectations, the brain's expectations are incredibly powerful, not only in managing pain, but in instantiating and reducing pain too. And it's, it's not just a matter of giving people the pills. I think we, we had the setting, the set and the setting matters enormously. There's a question there, and then there was one there. Yeah, sorry. Um, hiya, hi, thanks. Um, you, are, you said something during your speech I was going to pick up on, but you actually expanded on, on a previous question. So I hope you don't mind if I jump off from there. Um, you mentioned that the basic idea or sort of evolutionary justification behind viewing the brain as like a Bayesian processing engine is something like optimality, um, that there is some kind of sense in which uh, this would be what is optimal for achieving the brain's goals, however those are modeled in light of evolution. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose what I think of when I see those visual illusions mm -hmm. that you cannot see past, mm -hmm. um, so the one where there were two squares, and even though you knew on this side that they were the same color, you could not see past this one, is that either there's a failure of updating or there's probabilistically in incoherent likelihoods. And so you're updating, but in the wrong direction. Um, is that the correct way to think about your picture of the brain as a Bayesian engine? Um, and if it is, then like, can the brain be Dutch booked in that sense? Can the brain be what? Dutch booked. I, what is mean? there a failure? Is there a, a failure state in which the brain is making like incoherent judgments that will guarantee some loss against its own oh, interests. Right, right. So I, I'm not sure it is the way I, I think about it. So that particular illusion, I yeah, what's optimal depends on what you think that you know the, the kind of the loss function of the brain is, what it should be doing. And it's not trying to figure out the surface, it's not trying to figure out what the what the light you know, wavelengths actually are. It's trying to figure out what's the most likely situation out there in the world. We perceive a checkerboard. That is the most likely thing that's out there. And so I think, you know, the overall, you know, over different hierarchical levels, low levels dealing with, with shapes and things, those prediction, there will be some low level prediction error that like, the, but, but that gets resolved because the overall perceptual best guess settles on what is in fact a very good explanation of the causes of the sensory signals, which is that there is a checkerboard. Um, and that's, that's, I think, totally fine. So I don't think it does reveal a sort of failure mode of the brain. The brain is not a light meter. It's trying to figure out what's going on in the world in the case of vision, or it might be in, in some cases it's trying to figure out something else, like trying to control, you know, use predictions for control too. Um, so it's it's yeah I, I I think it's there are cases of course where this where this might not be so accurate or so optimal. So I'm not saying brains always do everything perfectly. I think the challenges for the brains that we have and the, the Bayesian engines that we have inside our skulls come when the priors that we get from evolution are no longer well suited to the environments in which we live. You know, and one situation where we see this very dramatically now is in our abilities to, to deal with um, things that happen over long time scales or, or far away. You know, we, we don't perceive them with a sense of urgency that they warrant. Uh, we, we still have very parochial brains. We, we react emotionally and we act in response to things that happen that are close to us in time and space. That's how our perception of cognitive machinery works. 
But these are no longer the only important things, as we know, with climate change and wars happening on other sides of the world. But we, we, we just can't have, you know, most of us just don't muster emotional responses to these things. And it's not our fault. It's just that's the way the brain is. And that, I think, in that larger context, that is a failure mode of the Bayesian brain. I think we've probably got time for, well, we're, let's see if this is a quick question. There may be yes, one more here, and then we have to let the speaker talk. Uh, despite having worked for the United Nations, my perception of the world is that it's not in complete chaos. Good. Therefore, does that mean that the construction and interpretation we impose on perception is sufficiently close to actual reality yeah. as to be good enough for all practical purposes, or am I being complacent? No, I think you're right. I think, you know, again, our perception machinery did not evolve to be completely accurate, you know evolution is happy with good enough and then it moves on i mean that's that's why we get older right you know good enough for us to stay alive long enough to, until we've had kids and they've grown up a little bit then whatever then it just sort of lets us go um so yeah that's so adequacy and utility rather than optimality is i think the right criterion but i'm glad to hear from your perspective that things are not as as chaotic as they might seem they certainly seem pretty chaotic okay we'll take one last question down here You've used the word dream tonight. You've even built a dream machine, but you haven't really discussed dreams. I wonder what you think dreams say about the dissociation of perception from sensory input. And also, what do you think about hypnopompic illusions? For those of us who get them, they're absolutely super real yeah. and instant. And what, what do you think? Yeah, okay. That's, about that's a really nice note to finish on. So I did not talk much about actual dreams. This is true, even though I talked about the dream machine. Um, there is, of course, there are many ideas about what what dreams are for, why we dream. It's it's all it's for me again. It's pretty obvious. There must be a reason. Things in biology don't just happen when they're this salient. Um, Freud has his ideas, but I think that the idea that that I that I find quite compelling. Uh, comes from a neuroscientist uh, called Eric Howell in the in the US, and he came up with this this thought that basically back to the idea that we've got predictive brains again, that we're always making best guesses. Now, this means every waking moment, the brain is kind of training itself on some new data from from the world. So, like just like in AI, we have these language models that train themselves on the internet. Our brain is continually training itself on new data. And we know in, in machine learning that if you overtrain uh, a system, you can't, it doesn't generalize very well. It does very well on, on things it's been trained on, but it fits it too well. It can't really deal with new situations. So one way to mitigate that is to allow the models that, the brain, that, thing, that are learned to kind of free run and prune themselves. So you, they just preserve the, the deep structure of the data so then they can generalize better so this might be what's happening in dreams like the free running of our perceptual predictive machinery to sort of prune it down so that we can see better the next day it's very it's very speculative but it's it's one interesting idea i think about what dreams might be for then these these illusions the hypnagogic and the hypnopompic illusions these for those of you who most of us do at least at some times these are uh, sort of the borders of, of sleep when you're falling asleep or waking up. Um, also in anesthesia, when you're coming around from anesthesia, you can have these very vivid uh, hallucinations, basically. Um, and it's, it's very hard to study these things because you, know, the, <laughs> you can't really just get people to do it on, on demand. But it does seem to be a bit like, you know, we don't fall asleep all at once. You know, the brain um, actually in sleep, Part of it, it can be the case that some of the brain is asleep and other parts of the brain are not asleep. Local sleep is a, is a kind of thing. Next time you say, oh, my, I felt half asleep, it might be literally true. Um, and, and dreaming, seem, these, these illusions seem to be what happens when you know, your brain is starting to, to do the dreaming bit, but it actually hasn't shut off uh, normal perception either. Because when you, when you do dream, you, you sleep, the brain basically blocks 
most sensory channels apart from hearing and touch. And, and that if that hasn't happened, then you might get these weirdly intermixed and very vivid phenomena. Okay, thank you all very much. I need to bring this fascinating experience to an end. Um, but mainly I want to thank Anil very much for a, a beautiful, amazing lecture and for, for answering our questions so clearly and in, well, so clearly. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.